welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth, brought to you by Grounded Press. My name is Dana Petrovic, and each week my guests and I explore one aspect of Mother Earth and the gifts that she gives us. We also discuss why these gifts are so precious and why we should value them. They got you curious? Good. We love curiosity. Let's start. In past episodes of Conversations with Mother Earth, guest speakers have talked about some very wide ranging and very direct topics regarding caring for our Mother Earth. For example, if you have not already, I encourage you to watch the episodes about our planet's soil, how winds bring change, discovering the diversity of bugs in our urban environment, the advantages of consuming organic chocolate and understanding the importance of oceans and rivers. We have also discussed subjects that are less directly connected to Mother Earth, but are equally crucial for our collective well-being on our planet, such as storytelling, dance, poetry. At the core of all these themes is something fundamental to us humans, namely our ability to creatively change as we adapt to our environment. <laughs> These exact same traits can obviously also be witnessed by learning from Mother Earth and the miracles that she gives us every day. She constantly manages how our planet must adapt and evolve. The, Ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus said that we cannot step into the same river twice. He is renowned for teaching that our world only exists of the continual change of an uh, interchange between all of the elements on our planet. He argued that the laws of nature must become a moral law for all human beings to follow. Now, over two and a half millennium after Heraclitus, and the role of um, and the role of change is meant to be a thought broker um, for my next speaker to introduce on conversations with Mother Earth. My guest today is Nadia Zhezhenbaev, who has several nicknames: the Reinvention Guru or the queen of reinvention, to name just two. Born and raised in the Soviet Union and a daughter of the days to Kazakhstan, she completed all her studies in the United States, including her PhD in organization behavior. Nadia and I have a few things in common. We are both professors. Nadia was in Europe, both TEDx speakers. Nadia had, has few speeches more than me. Uh, both book authors and also consultants. I first heard of, of Nadia in 2015 due to her program at INSEAD in Paris, and I have been following her work since. Hence, today is a very special day for me. Nadia, a big warm hello and welcome to Conversations with Mother Earth. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Nadia, um, as you know, the podcast is called Conversations with Mother Earth. And let's start with the big picture. Mm -hmm. In your book, The Titanic Syndrome, you define reinvention as a practice of embracing change by reimagining and remaking something so that it manifests significantly new and with improved attributes, qualities, and results. Mm -hmm. Where do you see reinvention around us today? And how does nature manage reinvention? <laughs> Well, nature is the original reinventor. If you think about the ebb and flow of life, everything in nature is reinvented again and again, every molecule. When I die, it might be a sad event for my loved ones, but for bacteria in earth, if I'm buried properly, this is a party. And when they are decomposing my body, they turn it into soil and I become a flower, quite literally. There's nothing poetic about it. I quite literally, hopefully, will become a tree and a flower and tomato. And that, that fruit or vegetable 
will be eaten by the animal and suddenly I'm reinvented as an animal. So in terms of the flow, nature is circular and every molecule on planet Earth has been reinvented again and again. Even the objects we consider very human, this phone is actually tons of particles that at different points were at different places on Mother Earth, part of the ore, part of the water, part of the air, and now they are reinvented into the phone. And unfortunately, of course, for us, this particular transformation is harder for nature to reinvent back into itself, but it's not possible. Even the longest decomposing products eventually will still come back to their original form and reinvent it again. Yeah, that's interesting that you mentioned because I, I asked my students, I showed them a plant and say, is this nature? And everybody says, yeah, of course, this is nature. So I showed them my phone and say, is this nature? No. So why not? So I just did a speech a few days ago about exactly that topic. Why do we think that one is nature and the other isn't when we, everything is nature? Everything. everything. There's nothing on this planet that is not made of the uh, molecules that come from Earth. The issue, of course, is that when nature reinvents, it makes sure that everything at the end of its one form is useful for the next stage. So mm -hmm. there is no death. There is just next form and next form and next form. Unfortunately, we as human beings are just beginning to think in such circular way. There is no waste in nature as wonderful architect and chemist Bill McDonough said, waste equals food. In nature, there's no such thing as waste. My waste is somebody else's food. We are not as good at designing that way, but we're learning to be better. And the amount of new designs that are more uh, close to the way nature does it, the whole field has grown, biomimicry has grown specifically to learn yeah. from nature how to do that kind of design. And I'm sure we will. And we are already improving quite quickly. Yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Uh, we see that the, the circular economy is a fancy which we both, <laughs> both teach. So definitely, definitely that is a, a, some promising view. Um, and how can uh, we humans best change to re or reinvent with ourselves? What does your experience tell you? What can we do to accept that circle, you know, that it is wisdom. Because as you said, we, we, we don't really accept it. Uh, how can we reinvent ourselves all the time? We don't accept it relatively lately. So this is a recent development. And it's also that we are not born resistant to change. When babies are born, I have a 17 year old. So I still remember very clearly when she was a newborn or a one-year-old, she didn't need any motivation to start something new. She didn't need a bonus to reinvent. She didn't need to be motivated to start walking. Reinvention is a birthright. It's something we are born with. The problem is that we are educated out of it. And there is no conspiracy here. It's not some evil powers trying to control us. It's more that in the last few centuries, relatively recently, reinvention became relatively unnecessary. We lived at the time of industrial revolution. We got to the place of thinking of the world in very mechanistic terms, but also stabilizing the world and looking at the world where stability is good and change is bad. That mm -hmm. is not the way nature works. There is nothing stable in quotation marks in nature, there's a difference between stability and harmony. Nature yeah. does dynamic harmony. That is very Balance. different than balancing in every moment. That's very, yeah. very different than static stability. So we misplace the idea of dynamic harmonizing with this view that stability is good and change is bad. And we are learning our way out of it. The recent decade of extreme disruption constant uncertainty and volatility finally forcing us to give up the idea that stability and good is good and learning how to live in the world of continuous change and actually be successful, happy, and productive. 
Yeah, that's an interesting topic because we also had an episode about wind. And of course, it's not just about wind in, in real terms, what they mean for Mother Earth, but also in our lives. And René, who was my speaker, um, said, uh, when we have no winds, we have uh, uh, nothing moves. Mm -hmm. When we look at the sea and there is no movement, for example, we have, things are dying, actually. Um, yeah. We have, uh, the, it's the movement uh, of streams that actually uh, brings new life in it and keeps it sustained, keeps it fresh, keeps it beautiful. Well, but you and I are alive right now because of movement, because blood is moving through our veins. The moment the heart stops pumping the blood, you and I will be dead within a few minutes. Okay. Movement is the essence of survival. Sustainability is reinvention every single moment. And movement yeah. is the only way to sustain. And actually, every moment our cells, certain cells die and the new are born and... Uh, uh, there is also balance in that. That's co that's correct. But for us humans, here's a funny thing: creativity is linked to change. We seek, mm -hmm. we like creativity. When we look as, at art, how it evolved over time, and it's always, which is always a reflection of our societies, we do celebrate creativity. But at the same time, we don't see the essence that at, at the essence of art, at this core of the art, is change. I think there are two things here. Uh, one is, yes, change is the essence of life. But when we're dealing with quite rapid change and high level of uncertainty, equally to managing change is managing continuity. Mm -hmm. So the problem is that we seem to be going to the extremes, either extreme love of stability or extreme love of change. And the truth is always in the middle. And the art of reinvention that is successful is to take managing continuity as seriously as we take managing change. In that sense, we can keep the best of the past and let go of things that no longer serve us. The reason why we don't like change, we resist change, is because we're afraid to lose something, lose something very important to us. That's why we are resisting, we are in fear of loss. Once we know what is unchangeable, unbreakable, uncompromisable, it's much more easy to be open to change because you know what is true, what is essential will never be lost. And that's what indigenous cultures have done for a long time. Yeah. I come, of course, from a nomadic culture. And nomadic culture uses oral tradition as a means of continuity, meaning that there are stories and myths that pass on for thousands of years, and they become a source of continuity, and they become a way to make it easier to move because nomads move all the time. We don't have a stable home. We pack up the yurt and we move to the next location. But there is a connection, there is a thread there that is combining the dance between the change and continuity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting what you say. Yes, we have to, um, we have to embrace continuity. And uh, there's so much wisdom in all these old, old stories. We talked about storytelling before we had a, a best-selling author uh, from Nigeria. So also take, take that storytelling as old as humanity itself. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good point. Your work today is grounded firmly in a business world mm -hmm. and you help business or you have companies reinvent themselves. According to your writing, a company needs to reinvent itself every two to three years. Mm -hmm. How are companies managing this urgency to speed up change? Depends on the company. This number comes from the research we do every two years. So we've started this tradition that every two years we do a survey, quite extensive survey across all industries and regions and size of companies to understand uh, what is the speed of change that we need to be aware of today and how do we manage that speed in the most effective and efficient way. And of course, it depends on the company. It depends on the industry. We do see that today about 60% of companies reinvent every two to three years or even less, about 16% reinvent every 12 months or less. This is 
telecommunications, this is fast moving consumer goods, but it's varies by industries. There are some industries, extractive industries, monopolies that have a little bit more time, but they still need to reinvent. Sometimes it's not about the product. Sometimes it's processes, business models, other things, but they still need to reinvent to remain in business. So different companies do it differently and different companies do it at a different rate of success. Unfortunately, altogether, we're not very good at reinvention and therefore forecast after forecast suggests that vast majority of businesses in the next 10 years will not survive. Recently, Inosite put that out, Boston Consulting Group did that research at the beginning of 2020, even before the pandemic. And all of them are speaking about the fact Boston Consulting Group was speaking about one third of the companies will be gone within five years. Most companies are just not good at it. Those who are good at this treat reinvention in a very unique way. Specifically, they are no longer seeing reinvention as a project, as something you do from time to time to adapt and then things normalize. There's no such thing as normalization anymore and change and reinvention is no longer a project, it's a process. Let me compare that, let me give you a metaphor. Treating change and reinvention as a project is like putting together a wedding. Hopefully you do it maybe once, twice, maximum three times a year in your lifetime. So it's maybe once every 20 years, maybe once every 40 years, or maybe once in your lifetime. You don't have all the skills in house. You hire somebody to help you with cooking and event and um, church and whatever else you do. You don't keep that skill in your own life and your own family. And this is a one-time project. You push through, there's a finite end, there is a result, you're married or you're not married and it's it. Today, reinvention, when done successfully is more about building a process and that's closer like taking a shower. If I don't take a shower on a regular basis, I begin to stink. Same with your businesses, your careers, your family traditions, your products, your services, your processes, your markets. If you don't reinvent on a regular basis, your companies begin to stink. So the question is that in your shower, hopefully you don't invent a new way of taking a shower every day. Hopefully it's not a big, massive project that you stress over. Hopefully you have supplies ready all the time, soap and towels and shampoos. And hopefully you have a process set up, you know what you're washing first, second, third, there is no big surprise there. Nobody's like, oh my God, I need to take a shower. But that's the transition we're talking about. We are talking about going from reinvention as a project we outsource or do very rarely to reinvention is a process that goes through every life, the way budgeting process goes through every life of human life or business life. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and one other thing you talk about a lot in, in your work, and uh, um, when I when I read the, the book or your emails, um, and it is that you prefer to, uh, the companies to use the term reinvention instead of innovation. And innovation is a very very popular term. So what's the reason yeah. for this view? Uh, it is. I, generally speaking, prefer any term that is closest to your industry. So when it comes to your actual company, I don't care what terms you use. Use whatever will create the most generative, the most effective dialogue for everyone involved. So when I wrote the famous Harvard Business Review article, Stop Calling it Innovation, if you go through the article, you will see, I'm not saying I hate the word, I'm saying that if you want innovation to be successful, stop using the jargon, stop creating this big thing, uh, to use the terms that are closer to the people on the ground. And every industry has slightly different moods, slightly different language. So don't use a term that sounds like Portuguese in Japan. Start using the terms that are closest to the industry. But when we talk about the philosophy of reinvention, it's quite different from philosophy of innovation. We first know that there is uh, plenty of research that shows the word innovation, generally speaking, is associated with most, for most of employees, more than 
80% employees do not like the term innovation, and it's heavily, heavily associated with risk. And most people just don't like risk. It's too much. It's too much pressure. But also, I, for me, in my research, innovation is just one of nine different types of reinventions. And sometimes innovation is the right thing you need in the cocktail of things, but it's not the only one. There are other things you can do, incremental change, uh, intermediate change. You don't always need a massive innovation to get the job done. Actually, you need a diversity of projects. Just like nature needs different types of insects to create the same effect. I was always you know, not a big fan of flies until I learned that flies do a huge effort to support bees in pollination. And when the bees started dying in the US, you know that more than 50% of US population of bees has already been gone. It was flies who were the first to pick up the, the, the emptiness. The, they are great creatures. So nature never bets on just one species to do the job, but always diversified. Same with reinvention portfolio. You cannot bet just on innovation. You need many different types of reinvention, innovation being just one of them. Yeah, it's interesting. We talked about bugs uh, in uh, one of the episodes and the role they play in the ecosystem because I, I, I love them. Um, <laughs> yes, I see them. I see them behind you. Yeah, they're, they're great helpers. The wonderful helpers, and that's exactly what, why I talked with the bug woman of London. It was a very interesting conversation. Um, but back to the research uh, that you mm -hmm. just mentioned, uh, Nantia, I have a question about another research, and I don't know if you have results. How do you think that our own creative individual approaches to change and these choices business leaders must confront or similar? Um, what I'm trying to ask is it do you observe that the more creative business leaders also lead companies through the change? Is this self-explanatory? Is there a correlation? What does the research show? I do not have data, so I cannot say. I cannot say that I can confirm that the more creative you are, the better you are at change. It's actually more complex than that. My view of reinvention is an ecosystem view in which you need different parts working together. Like every ecosystem, there are parts of the ecosystem that build, but there's also very important parts of the ecosystem that destroy. So again, talking about my body, decomposing my body is a job for millions of bacteria, and they are doing a crucial job. Decomposing, deconstructing, destroying something, has tremendous value, as much of the value as building. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, in a corporate environment, there are jobs that are more about creating things. That's where creativity comes to mind. But there are also places where you need to be destroying things. And we need to start respecting those professions, respecting those, sorry, I have some water as I'm, I'm losing my, my sound, we need to learn how to respect those professions as well and respect the diversity. In this case, not biodiversity, but corporate diversity and functional diversity. And when we speak about the healthy reinvention cycle, there's one part of a cycle that is about change, but then there's another part of the cycle that is continuity, that is settling things down. And those are rarely celebrated as creative professions. They're the boring ones. They're the ones who create procedures. They're the ones yeah. who create standards, who create norms. And those norms are crucial for a healthy system to work. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you're absolutely right. Um, another another uh, topic, we both uh, grew up in a socialist system. Mm -hmm you in Soviet Union, I in Yugoslavia, yet today we both are very much pro-business. Mm -hmm. um, many businesses today have earned dishonorable reputations, pollution, mm -hmm. worldwide pollution, excessive pays to the top employees while the rest uh, has to, uh, cannot even survive on their income and so on and so on. Should we value the business today? And what kind of business should we trust? What do you think? Again, this is not an issue of business. It's an issue of human civilization. And this is an ecosystem view. 
Yeah. The same people who are upset with business pollutions are the same people who are demanding low prices at the store and the same people who are demanding high return on their pensions because most of us today are investors, at least in the developed world, because of our pensions, including government pensions. Your government pension is invested in the capital markets and you are expecting a healthy pension. Therefore, you are expecting that the market will maximize the profit for your pension to be there. So all of us, it's not those people, the business people, it's all of us who mm -hmm. are participating in the ecosystem that is creating the unfortunate or fortunate impacts of business. And all of us need to start reinventing capitalism as a whole. It's very clear that today's forms of capitalism are simply not working. And it's not just businesses, there's things between business, for example, money. A monetary system is on the verge of complete collapse and we have to yes. figure out a different idea of what money is and how yes. we're gonna work with money. But that is just a sign that the whole world is asking for reinvention and the whole world will expect you to play a part in it. Yeah, yeah. we all have to play a part of this. We all have to call, this is what we discussed also about the oceans, how can we support? Because I have a former minister of environment from, from Jordan as my guest. And we talk about how can we actually all chip in because we have to support the, the good decisions we have to uh, show that with our with our vote we can show it with buying certain products yeah uh, or uh, electing certain leaders so then we can, we have a say in this every time we vote when we buy or don't buy when we yes. go to elections or when we don't go to elections that's also a vote exactly. so every exactly. time we point the fingers and say it's them and there is there is a quite heavy uh, systemic issue. So I'm not saying that there is no systemic problems. There are systemic problems and there are systemic issues that have to be corrected at a massive scale. But it's not just one thing that is wrong. It's the ecosystem that is not doing well and is asking for reinvention. Exactly. We have to exactly we have to change the system in some cases, a complete system reinvention um but can businesses solve our environmental issues do you think so it can if we go back to the heraclitus uh, where he uh, argued that underlying laws of nature must become a moral law for human beings to follow and of course they're for business um can businesses solve some of our environmental issues they are uh, when I started my scientific work in the field of sustainability in 2001, exactly 20 years ago, the very first project we've done was to prepare for a conference we ran together with a wonderful professor, Peter Senge of MIT, the, the god of systemics thinking and the author of Fifth Discipline. And we've done research to see where are businesses doing generative practices, where are they actually restoring both social and environmental performance, because there is no such thing as just social or just environmental. It's very, very yes, deeply connected. Exactly. And when we've done that research, which was run between October and May, in all of the interviews, and we've done more than 400 cases of companies, there were three companies that we felt comfortable to present as good cases, as cases that can be learned from. Within about five to seven years, we got three cases per day. And today it's in Saudans. So it's happening. Is it happening fast enough? The recent reports on climate change suggest it's not. But at the same time, knowing human ingenuity and knowing the nonlinear leaps in learning that we have had in the past, I have my hope up. I'm a mom. I need hope. So yep. I, when I'm a objective observer a scientist sometimes it's hard to keep hope but when i'm a mom i have to keep hope otherwise that's all i've got yeah yeah exactly exactly we have to keep hope we have to keep observing and calling to action <clears throat> sorry creating new knowledge testing yeah. new tools working with companies rather than shaming them finding yes, a plus exactly. there are many different things we can do 
but yeah. I choose hope. I find it easier to live with hope than to live with despair or anger or hate. So for me, it's a it's an issue of choice more than it is an issue of objective reality. Yeah, exactly. As, as we are both consultants at the same time, and uh, we do training in leadership and communication, I have I haven't met an, an evil CEO yet. It's not that uh, they're all human beings like you and I, they're doing this, their best. They're also caught in a system. And sometimes we can show them that we support the change. We can yeah. contribute to that actually with our choices. I, I'm with you. Absolute majority of business leaders and managers and employees I meet want to do a good job want exactly. to be proud of waking up in the morning, want to feel like their life has meaning, want to feel like they're not ashamed of telling which company are they working for. So most of the time, that's the case. Are there crooks occasionally? Yes. Are there people who are using the power and abusing the power of their companies? Yes. I've met those too. But most of the time, 99 plus percent of the time, people are honestly trying to do the best. We are just not catching up fast enough with what the civilization is expected of us. And that's exactly. where us as a scientist and educators come in is to give better tools, to give new technologies. And that's also the reason why we started building the toolkit around reinvention is because we realize a lot of the things are not moving, not because people don't believe in climate change or don't believe that there is a better way. They simply don't know how to make it happen. Yeah, exactly. And we have to be on a trajectory to 1.5 uh, degrees uh, temperature increase. If we go beyond that, uh, the damage will be will be enormous. And, and the other, th other thing I noticed in a business world, and I don't know if you can confirm this, is fear. Um, so taking fear away from business leaders with our choices, with our cons consumption, <clears throat> sorry, one more time, with our consumption, with, with all of that, helps them also make the right decisions? Uh, fear is a very needed, natural, and underappreciated emotion. If you're afraid, you're normal. Congratulations, you're healthy. If you were not afraid, <laughs> that would be a reason for concern. So fear is very, very needed, and the function of fear is focus. The reason we have fear is our body telling us, wake up, wake up, there's the danger. There's something to pay attention to. Come on, concentrate, zoom in, get the blood going, pay attention. Of course, when we talk about the fight or flight syndrome, it's not exactly the most helpful reaction of the body when we need to think creatively or hear new voices. But thankfully, the normal fight or flight fear reaction is about 90 seconds and just there to give you a jolt. Use yeah. it. Don't fight it. Use it. Use it yeah. to concentrate. Use it to mobilize. Use it to pay attention to what is your body trying to tell you. And use it when you feel it in the company. Use it as a natural immune system. Don't waste that energy. Exactly. Exactly. There's a beautiful quote. Courage is not the absence of fear. Uh, we Absolutely. Just have to use it and step through it and, and uh, yeah. do it. Exactly. Exactly. Nadia, as you know, I love your work. I'm a big fan of your work and I could Me talk too. to you. <laughs> I could talk to you for hours. Um, but uh, I'm sure that my listeners would also like to know about your work. Where can they find you? Oh, the easiest way is to go to our website, learn to reinvent.com. And in that URL, Two is a number. So learn number two, reinvent. Learn to reinvent.com or just Google learn to reinvent and you will find us. We have a wonderful gift for you. We have an 85 page preview of my latest book on how oh. to thrive in chaos. And it has two tools. It has a great case and it has a lot of data I mentioned. So I invite you to go grab it and download it. And of course, we will provide it for you to add to the show notes as well. Oh, Thank you so much. We will add that to the page with the link, and uh, it will of course be in our uh, in my uh, Instagram and Facebook profiles, Grounded Press, Instagram, LinkedIn, and, and um, Facebook profiles. We will put it everywhere, dear listeners, so you can find it. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend everything that Nadia does. It's inspiring, uh, but at the same time, very practical, approachable and helps us uh, do reinvention every single 
time, every single day, every single moment. So thank you so much, Nadia, for joining us today. It's such a for pleasure you. to be here. I'm honored and thank you for this invitation. Oh, thank you so much. Dear listeners, this concludes today's conversation with Mother Earth, brought to you by Grounded Press. Next week, we will weigh how and where. I'm taking you to a beautiful country that actually consists of several islands. Got you curious? Stay tuned.